Today, our topic is going to be related to a cultural issue that I think is misrepresented. And maybe some people don't understand the totality of the effect of it, but I'm gonna address that right here. So the topic is gonna be about rap music, explicitly the uh, gangster rap music, the rap music that's infiltrated with cursing, drug dealing, the, the degradation of women, um, you name it. You know, I think that that culture, that hip hop culture has definitely influenced our young people and it has been a true detriment to society. And I'm not just saying this because it's something I read in a book. I'm saying this because I have personal knowledge of this. I have personal experiences that have gotten me to this conclusion of believing that this is not good for our children and hip hop music is killing us. Literally, I'm not even saying no pun intended. Literally, hip hop music is influencing young people to kill each other, young people to treat women with disrespect, young people to act outside of character and, and to be enraged and to hate other people. This is exactly what's happening to young people. So I'm explaining in a few different um, topics. So the first topic is just my own personal experience. You know, I grew up listening to rap music almost every single genre that I listened to had something to do with rap, had some, something to do with explicit gangster rap. And it influenced and it packed my mind. So much so to, believe it or not, people don't even believe me when I say this. This is, this is a part of my testimony. Is that I used to sag my pants, I had gold teeth in my mouth, and I got Young Savage tattooed on my stomach right here. It's because of the mindset and, and, and the culture of hip hop music had me thinking that this was the appropriate way to dress, this was the appropriate way to act, this was the this was my role model. And in today's society, we have accepted it. Another aspect of hip hop music, the rap culture, gangster rap, that I think we are avoiding to address. For, for instance, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So the President of the United States uh, made a statement uh, that many people will believe was derogatory towards women, that it was inappropriate. I don't, I don't think anybody who heard that would think anything different. And the America was outraged. America was upset about that. And America voiced their opinion about thinking that that was wrong. And the President of the United States apologized for it, which, which I accept his apology. But this is the thing that I feel like that we, we there's no apology in hip hop music. Every song, every lyric, 90% of the rappers are saying things that are even uh, are, are what the president said and worse with no apology. And they're not saying it 30, you know, 11 years ago. They're saying it currently today. Your kids who are listening to rap are listening to him say, these rappers say the same thing that, that you were outraged about the president saying times 20. And we don't talk about those things. We're not outraged about those things, which, which, are, which is troubling to me. Because we should be identifying these, these, this language that's being used. We should, be, we should be identifying this culture that's infiltrating our, our society and not just be outraged when one person say it, but be outraged at a culture that has way more influence, way more people listen to hip hop music than would ever listen to the president of the United States, period. It, it just will never happen. So there's a, another misconception that we have is that the effect, right? Some people will say, oh, rap music is just music, right? It don't really affect. It's just people saying stuff. It don't affect me. But I'm going to tell you this, and this is, this is, like I said, this is from my own personal experience. When you live in Beverly Hills, rap music don't affect you, right? When you live in a gated community or you live in somewhere above the poverty line, you live in middle class America or you live in the upper, upper echelons of America, what they say in these rap songs don't resonate with you. It sound good, it's cute, it's got a good beat, it's cool, it's trendy to you. When you live in the hood, this is like the gospel. You are seeing th this rap music play out in front of you every day. You, you, you are seeing, you know, degrading women as a topic of discussion in almost any environment when you live in the hood. It, you are almost considered a coward if you don't treat women or act the way these rappers are acting. If you're not speaking the lingo that rappers are speaking, you are nobody. And it affects people every day in these communities, especially in low-income communities. 
Breakdown Friday, Joseph Ward, Professor Carl Tone Jones, Patrick Irvin. We are back here for another one. Thank you all for the love and support that you all continue to give this channel. Today, the question on the table is, did hip hop or rap or gangster rap or trap drill, did this music, did rap music, did hip hop music destroy the black community? Or was our community already destroyed and this is just the music that was we were expressing, you know, the destruction around us. So that's the question on the table. You saw the video, um, Officer Tatum. I think he had some valid points, but we're going to break some of these things down and see how this really affects us. Because this video, he recorded this video, I think, five years ago. So in 2023, how is it? What's how is uh hip hop music today? Is it positive? Is it negative? How is it really affecting us? But overall, did hip hop destroy our community? Patrick, yo, did hip hop destroy our community? No, uh, not single handedly. <laughs> um, I think, I think going to the clip, well. Mm -hmm. That's Officer Tatum, right? Right. Um, I think he touched on a lot of things, but at least from that clip, it doesn't seem like he has a thorough enough understanding of what he's talking about to really be talking about it. Um, okay. But the shorthand answer to my question is that... that did hip hop destroy the black community? No, it did not, not by itself, but it is a tool or a weapon that I think has been used to um, expose vulnerabilities and attack certain pressure points in the community. Okay, so what what type of weapon is it? Like, how has it become a weapon in your opinion? Well, for me, that gets into a larger discussion about how culture works, mm -hmm. how culture is shifted. We start talking about things like the Overton window and the political spectrum, um, which I think also holds a lot of weight in cultural perspectives. But um, I think music, we have this conversation all the time. Music is influenced by the people that create it who are then also influenced by the mm -hmm. music itself. Um, I think- I think that's where we are now at this point. Right. I think the way music shifts a culture is that it, it slowly gets people to consider things that may have at once been considered taboo, that, that might now not be as taboo. And so you start moving that window of acceptable, what's acceptable and what's not, closer and closer to this, the 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 um closer and closer to things that people that are locked in on one spectrum or the other would view as outrageous. It's a subtle shift, um, but it is a shift that happens. And I'm trying to simplify it, but I do think people that control the music that's put out there that control the narrative do have the ability to influence what's acceptable and what's not in terms of the cultures that primarily consume that music. Now, the flip side of that is also we know the primary consumers of hip hop music, the ones that, you know, the people that are driving the money behind it are white people. Right. So then we that brings us into another conversation about well, if hip hop is poisonous, if it's toxic, where is their immunity coming from? And so that's why I said the conversation about culture, it gets into a bunch of other conversations that need to be had around this topic of hip hop. Um, and that's another reason why I said even with the way Officer Tatum is talking about it, he's he's touching on some things that mm -hmm. need to be touched on but mm -hmm. he's not touching on them in a way that gives me the impression that he should be the one trying to touch him you know so, what i'm saying like I, I, he ain't I, married I, to the game he just a stranger trying to cop a feel and i i get that i get that so 
basically, we agree on that. I'm, we agree. We both agree. I think all three of us agree on that. But it's the the conversation that I'm picking from it. So, you know, yeah, we we on the same page on all that. But the conversation though is, you know, talking about the effect of the music. So, like you said, and we're gonna put a pin in this because we're gonna come back. But like you said, we have this specific genre of music that was created by black people in America and white people primarily are the drivers behind what music is produced and the consumers of the music but the bulk of the negative effects of the music are seen in the black community and more specifically the poor black communities so to you uh, PC did in your opinion do you think hip hop destroyed the black community no <laughs> um i think the black community was has been destroyed the i don't think the black community ever got to a point where it wasn't destroyed. it was the black community we may have had some uh we, we may have had some 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 moments of peace in the black community we might have may have had some moments of prosperity but for the most part, there's never been a stable black community in America. So, and when you consider that uh, we have never had an era of peace in America where black people can actually, where we're actually just left alone to build uh, without outside influences, then no, nah, it's, it's, it wasn't that it could, it, I, I give black people credit for being resilient um, and, the stand, and stand in the tide, but I think eventually that resilience wears down um and we talk about it a lot when we talk about the demoralization of a people where they just start, look like they start to give up the fight i think that's where we are right now and the, this current era of hip-hop is sort of ref, is a reflection of that so i think what we're seeing is uh art imitating life and then art influencing life like patrick was saying you know uh and I, when I when I when I think about the influences of music, this is not a new tactic to influence the culture. Back in the Roaring Twenties, uh, when people could, when 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 you had designers who couldn't sell clothing, they couldn't sell shoes, they couldn't sell new hats, they couldn't sell new coats because back then people were operating from a a place of functionality. So if my coat is still good, why do I need to go out and buy a new coat? They started putting superstars in in these particular cars. They started putting superstars in these uh the, the, these this fancy attire. And they were utilizing that to influence people to if you want to live like a superstar, you're gonna need this new coat. That's when mink coats started coming out. If you want to live like a superstar, then you're gonna to have to dress in this particular suit. If you want to be a superstar, I mean, if you want to live the life of the rich and famous, then you this is when you do, and that's that sort of that that impacted how people were marketed to, how all these trends were marketed. So if we fast forward, um, you go to 1954, right at the time where the uh, you know the 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 Brown versus Board of Education case was coming up in the Supreme Court. You had the United States uh, Department of Commerce do a study in a documentary called How to Sell the Negro. And they were arrogant enough to actually make a damn documentary and put it on TV uh, mm -hmm. to talk about how they knew that they can influence black people with big names and this, that, and the other. See, once you get to the place where you can influence people, the, the method stays the same. You just change what you're influence them, influencing them with. And that's one of the things I think that's, that we're seeing now. Now you talk about the rap destroyed, like, like not rap, but the hip hop destroyed the black community. Well, let's look at it like this. When King Von first started rapping, he was already a mass murderer. He just utilized rap because he saw it as a way to, 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 to sort of like uh, mock the people he was performing drills on. And also, and so that created a genre that that along with uh, Chief Keith out of Chicago created the genre of drill rap um, here in America. 
when you think about what that did, that wasn't hip hop. That was gangsters who decided to be murderers. I mean, gangsters who decided to be uh, rappers and, and utilize the music. Now, one of the things I say the influences is these guys didn't have to go through the loops that, that we had to go through if we were performing. If me, you, and Patrick was a group back in like 2020 or even before that, right, in the 90s, we would have to shop our deal, our mixtape to somebody, hope a DJ would play it in the club and it would pick up. We would have to go to, to a radio station and play that somebody would put our joint on the radio and then the next thing you know, it would pick up and then we would get a call from a label saying they want to sign us and things that they don't have to do this no more. These cats straight from Twitter, straight from YouTube, straight from Instagram, straight from TikTok. They go straight to it and they profit off of it. But now they have a direct line to the children. There's no buffers now. Yeah. yeah. There's no buffer. There's no, we. if we want to know what our favorite entertainer, our favorite hip hop artist is talking about, all we have to do is follow them on Twitter, follow them on Instagram, follow them on TikTok, whatever, and we'll know what they're saying up to the minute. Hell, the uh, last president, the one before this one, didn't have a press secretary. Well, his press secretary is practically useless because he was tweeting to the people. They were literally having meetings talking about how can I take his phone from him? We can't shut him up. And so now there's no buffer. Back in, you know, you talk about 30 years ago, you had to read a magazine, an article in the magazine to know what Tupac was saying about Big. To know to know what that there was an East Coast right. West Coast right. beef and, and things of that nature, which wasn't, but it was actually generated in the magazine. But you 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 had to read up on that stuff. By buying a magazine, you didn't. You just couldn't. You you could. You didn't have it in the palm of your hand like we have today. And so, so what's happening is we're seeing the direct influence of these things. And I'm just gonna say one more thing, right? What we what we really don't get is the psychology of it all. If you put something to a banging beat. That's what's going to draw the attention and the minds of people that are listening to it. Like that situation that's going on in Jacksonville, the beatbox remix. Everybody was out here doing the dance and, you know, doing the dance and, and, and to the beat, singing the lyrics, not paying attention to the fact that they were naming people who were actually murdered in a gang war. But they were the beat was hitting. That's the psychology of it all, because so, one. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. no finish, finish up, finish up. The psychology of it all is if we play this over and over again, eventually, the words itself, your, your second, your, your subconscious will pick up on the words because you're being hypnotized by the words. You're being hypnotized to be desensitized to the murder and the killing and things of that nature. You be desensitized to. Uh, the, the graphic nature that we see in these videos and the discussions and their back and forth beats. You know, uh, you, you're desensitized to the fact that, wow, that's a 30-year-old woman grinding and, and twerking on a 10-year-old boy. We're desensitized to it all because the beat is slamming. And all we care about is bopping to the beat. And psychologically, subconsciously speaking, we're digesting and ingesting all of the negative stimuli from, from those particular... Um, you know, from, from the music. Right. So I don't believe hip hop destroyed the community. I believe like both of you said, it was a tool that has been used to help get us to where we are today, but it wasn't the sole factor. But I also ask a question. What was the conditions of black America in 1976? The year or, or what were what was going on around that time? What were the conditions that this music were created in? Was this music created in in uh, positive conditions or negative conditions? And that's a that's a question that's on the floor. Like what what was what was the culture like? What was because we talking the South Bronx, 1976. So what was the what was the culture like? What was the conditions like in the South Bronx in 1976 when this music was created? Because we know 
party it was created as party music you know people in that area looking to express themselves in a specific way within the environment that they was in so and i'm asking you pc because you know you i i know it by what oh, i've man. studied but <laughs> not 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 just that but you you are you are older so you are, you are, you have more of a direct you have more direct experience with it, but you grown up in North Philly, so you've actually been to these areas. I ain't never been to these areas, so that's why I'm like asking you, like, what was that? What was the conditions of the South Bronx in 1976? Well, I mean, I think I was two years old then, but um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the the conditions was the recovery from a, what looked like a third world country. All right, you had a lot of buildings that were. Um, mysteriously burnt down in the Bronx. A lot of high rises. Um, you had a lot of poverty. The Bronx was 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 considered the jungle. They called it the Bronx Zoo because uh it was that it was that wild out there. And you know, like you said, we you know Philadelphia and New York are like sister cities. Um we had similar situations here, you know, uh old warehouses and old factories that people would go into sometime into the park. They would, uh, you know, uh, and we would have uh, the parties in the park. We would have the parties in the um, in, in in these world, in, in these buildings. And, and a lot of it was because black people weren't black people weren't really allowed to go into the discos. So the the partying took place um, anywhere we could go, and it was it was more so just a place to hang out um a place to go party i mean you did have a lot of gang warfare going on in both cities at the time um and so uh like if you really want to understand what the culture was like just look at the movie beat street beat street gives you a good rundown of the culture where you know for the most part i mean you had your urban strife or whatever but it wasn't and if hip-hop wasn't when you heard hip-hop hip-hop was about uh just just basically you know uh having a good time vibing right. With, right. with one another right. um and yeah yeah once in a while something would go down because look at where you are <laughs> you know what i'm saying but, but you know it, it was it was a place where 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 we gathered and we were able to uh generate um a, a culture it was actually a culture that was right. generated right. you know um based on the circumstances of that time and based on the fact that uh you know we wanted to have a place where we can go and, and, and not be bullied and not have to deal with the racism that went on in those discos and clubs that we weren't allowed to go into so and right and so but like you said a culture was developed and when this culture was developed parts of this culture that were developed were destructive and negative because that's the environment that it came out of because we're talking about party music for people to go somewhere to have fun they couldn't go to the discos but it was also something better than banging all the time or you know uh, um being in the negativity all the time so and i know from the documentaries and things that i've seen when they show the south Bronx, i, I think you know hearing krs one and all the rappers at the time you know describe it as looking like a war happened like a post-war scene right so party music came out of this these are some of the seeds of this party music, this hip hop music. Also, things that you all said. Um, you were talking about gangsters being the ones who are making the music now. Yes, that's true, but that's always been true. That's not always been true as to the degree that it is now. But Easy E was in the streets. Suge Knight was in the streets. Snoop was in the streets. A lot of some of these earlier rappers were in the streets and yes jay-z and you know before and before it got to the time to where it's as destructive right now and but you still had these elements of this crime that was in hip-hop well oh go ahead pat no i think we we're gonna say the same thing go ahead go ahead no, no, but i just finished talking so you go ahead <laughs> you can tell, you oh ahead. um i think it's different though like you talking about Snoop, you talking about those guys. Um, they were street dudes, 
but they weren't necessarily killers. I get that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think even we talking about like I think two things have happened. One, the evolution of what's considered a good time, it's mm -hmm. changed. Um, and two, be and this is where I do think there's a direct impact of white people on influence on, on hip hop when you start talking about terms like slumming it and you start talking about terms like um you know selling records when hip hop became a business and the primary audience became white teenagers suburban teenagers who didn't necessarily want to listen to uh black party music per se they wanted to listen to hood stories you know what I'm saying? They wanted to feel like right. they were getting an education and what it meant to be a black person in the streets. So that lends itself to a certain narrative because they don't want to hear the truth of it either. They want to hear what they think is the actual truth. I had to shoot five people in the teeth last week. They want to hear stuff like that. Um, You know, they want to get that level of excitement. So what right. happens when they're the primary demographic buying the music? That type of music is the type of music making money. Now, all of a sudden, you got everybody trying to make money by making that type of music. So I think that's the driving uh, impact as well. But I, I like I like the conversation, even with what uh, PC was talking about, the, the hip-hop thing I, or the disco thing. I get so tired of people trying to, and this is primarily KRS-One pushing this movement. And yes, I'm... I'm, 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 I'm I get so tired of this narrative that hip hop was created to save the community from the dark forces that are like that's revisionist history at its core. Hip hop was created because y'all can't get into the discos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you wanted some place to party, you wanted some place to escape, and that's why the whole theme of hip hop. Is basically escaping who you are. A rapper come out making music using their real name is something amazing to behold nowadays. All of them is using some sort of WWE alias. You know what I'm saying? Mr. Slap Your Bitch on the Ass and all the crazy but, shit. See, but see, now you're getting into what I'm talking about. Go ahead. <laughs> and 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 the reason why I say that is. Yes, I understand Snoop and, and all these cats were not killers, but we're talking about seeds being planted. But we also, let's also be honest, weren't, weren't dope boys some of the earliest influence as far as style and fashion in certain ways people carried themselves in the early days? Absolutely. True. Um, Very true. Uh, but that was the change. That was the turnover. When hip-hop started, you know, you can go back to uh, a lot of the, the stuff. I mean, even though it was controversial at the time because they weren't necessarily clicked up with the crew, the Sugar Hill Gang, when they first came out, you know, um, with the songs they were talking about, they weren't talking no gangster stuff. They were talking about right. slapping Superman because he was wearing pantyhose. Um, right. But, you know, right. and, <laughs> I'm sorry, not to cut you off, but I want to ask this question with this. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Was the style run DMC had was that influenced by the dope boys of, of that time? I mean, yeah, they're from Jamaica Queens. Okay. So oh. they 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 but here's the thing. They influenced dope boys to wear those right. to, to right. wear the dress like that because at the time they were considered hardcore. Now when okay. you think about right. hardcore rap back then, they were just hardcore slamming beats, hardcore, you know, rhymes. But it wasn't mostly, I mean, shoot, these are the brothers that did Christmas time in Hollis Queens. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, when you talk about hip hop taking that turn, you had it in two places. You had it in New York and you had it in L.A. That's where hip hop took a turn. In New York, um, you had like the Supreme Team. You had uh, the three brothers out of the out of Harlem. Um, you know, uh, what was the what was the names? Um, Alpo. Ace and um, I mean uh, not Ace. Uh, what's the brother's name? I, 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 I feel bad for, for messing his name up, but you know what I'm talking about. Those three brothers and the one brother that got killed out of New, out of uh, 
they were trendsetters in terms of style because they would be the ones that um that people look to and then the rappers started doing videos dressed like them so yes they would influence the rap you see they once again influenced the culture of hip-hop it wasn't hip-hop influencing them uh you go to right the game right. rap and and here's the role Philly played. A lot of people don't know there was a, a gangster rapper um, out of West Philadelphia. I'm not going to say his name, um, but it was a gangster rapper out of Philadelphia. I almost said his name. <laughs> <laughs> right? Who who, who taught um, who taught NWA how to and how to do gangster rap? He actually schooled him. Um, okay, damn it, it's Schooly Dick. All right, <laughs> out of West Philly, who went out there and taught. West Coast rappers how to do it, but let's be let's understand something about that. That came at a time when you started having influential people in hip hop like Public Enemy. You know, you start having influential people like the Poor Righteous Teacher, um, KRS One um, after the the killing of his DJ Scott LaRock. Begin talking more so education and community um, issues and things of that nature. Um, informative rap. You started having those things. So to counterbalance that, uh, a lot of money was put into the gangster rap that that was formulated in the late '80s and early '90s, um, and in co coercion with and not, uh, not coercion, but in um, along with the heavily 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 investment of music producers into the prison industrial complex, like a lot of these things were taking place. Let, let's just let's just take it all the way back. This this all this stuff, all this traction started with the war on drugs with Nixon, in terms of how to continue to destabilize the black community. So you take that from the the seventies all the way up until the the nineties, and then you got to see the full, and then you deal with that with the crack cocaine era, in which the CIA was caught on record distributing crack cocaine within black communities to fund their wars. And the Middle East and uh, in Central America, so a lot of this, a lot of the stuff that happened, black people just happened to be um, not not just ca purposeful casualties of war. The black community itself is not hip hop. A lot of times, when you, especially when you talk to uh, the people like N.W.A. for instance, F the police was right after Rodney King. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a response to the Rodney King beat. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we don't understand is in that particular time, that was actually conscious rap. I got an education being from, from the East Coast in Philadelphia. I got an education of what it was like to be in the hood in South Central, what it was like to be in the hood in Compton, what it was like to be in the hood in Oakland. I got a, an education on that from being on this part of the country. I got an education on the South when I heard the brothers from New Orleans talking about, you know, rapping, the brothers from Texas talking, the brothers from Florida talking. I got an education on that. That, that in itself was the genesis, the culture of hip hop. Now, okay. it was perverted by, by, by the, probably the same people that burned those buildings down in the Bronx. Can't say their names. But it was perverted in that fashion. And that's where you start to see all the different, the, 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 um, the evil. The wicked nature of the, or the I'm not gonna say the dark, the dark side of, of humanity in our community purged out into the streets and it became popularized. I just got one more thing to say. This is why we 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 celebrate and we protect and we defend gutter culture. This is why when Sister Monique was telling sisters about wearing bonnets and, and fluffy uh, slippers in the airport, why she got so much backlash. This is why when we tell brothers you shouldn't be dragging your meat all over the place, we get we get uh, called out and, and we get reprimanded because we want to practice and hold on to gutter culture. Now, that in itself, I'm going to just leave it there. All right. So so you gave us a, you gave us a, a little snippet of how the music influenced you because i want to go there personally mm -hmm. on a personal level so throw it to pat pat how would you say hip-hop music affected you on a personal level um i think growing up i don't think growing up i didn't i, I loved east coast music east coast rap right I loved East Coast rap. I, I I never really, 
I didn't get into Southern rap until I was younger. Um, and I didn't really even put it together until recently, maybe a few years back. One of the reasons why, um, <laughs> one of the reasons why I used to always hear get people saying, you don't sound like you're from the South, even in Tallahassee, where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. People would be like, where you from? <laughs> no, I'm from here. I, <laughs> like, so I started telling people I was from Delaware because they never believed me when I told them I was from Tallahassee. <laughs> Um, and I think a lot of that was just based on the fact that, like, my favorite rappers were East Coast rappers. My Like, all of the stuff I was listening to, the TV shows, the musics, the, the movies, the everything I was listening to and consuming um, was not from my area. So I didn't sound like people from my area. Um so that's one of the biggest ways I think when I think about just the raw influence and the only reason I bring that up is because it was fresh. But um, I, I do think there was an influence there in terms of how do you talk to girls? How do you dress? How do you move? How do you walk? How do you, you know what I'm saying? How do you, uh, how do you carry yourself when you're in a situation? Right. Um, it particularly a dangerous situation because them really was the only situations you was getting educated on. Um, so even to that, there was a component of it that went into um, finding yourself unwittingly being excited to be in these situations. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like I think about when I first got mixed up in the drugs on um, the very first time I was transporting a cookie for some older guys I was like excited. I can say it now. I was excited, like, oh man, I'm out here. I'm out here doing it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, and even when uh, I had my situation where I went to court, um, I had a situation where I was in the courtroom. I was 15, 16 years old, and I think about it now. Um, I had my my hands were shackled to my waist. My waist was shackled to my feet. You know, I was all shackled up like I was some kind of major threat. Um, and there was a moment where there was a bit of like, yeah, motherfucker, y'all better be scared. As I'm walking through the courtroom, it wasn't until uh, I saw the face of somebody in the audience that I, I recognized and respected that that pride kind of drained away and gave way to the shame. Uh, the same shame that no longer exists anywhere in our community, sad to say. Um, but all of those things weren't just influenced by the music. It was also influenced by the environment that I grew up in. Like I grew up in every bad hood in Tallahassee, Florida, every last single one, you name it. I spent you at least me. a few years living there um, from the bro, Meadows, Texas the Street, and Holton, to Street, bro. Holton Street, you name it. I spent at least a few years living there. Um, so all of those things, so in that I get kind of kind of like, well, what was more of an influence? The music I was listening to or the environments that I was in. And then that is kind of hard to parse that out because the music I was listening to was also describing scenarios, but those scenarios weren't familiar or native to mine because I was listening to East Coast music talking about being in philly and being in new york and being in dc yes i consider dc east coast not southern deal with it <laughs> yep, yep, um, yep, yep. <laughs> yep. so and you know what i'm saying all of that uh but the, the the situation joe you can attest to this the situation in the south is distinctly different from those mm -hmm. situations mm -hmm. um but, and see ahead. that's but that's why i'm asking this specific question because you and I are both from Tallahassee, but we listen to different music. But PC is from Philly, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, I, I think we all listen to different stuff. And so that's why I'm trying to get a feel of how the music personally affected each of us differently. Because after this, I want to move into how does hip hop specifically, why does it negatively affect the black community, specifically poor black communities? But you're hitting on some of the things there. So, well, so. Uh, Go ahead. So finish up. No, no, no. I'm going to say this uh, and then I'll be finished up. But 
I didn't even with the 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 drug stuff like that. I can pinpoint that. That was Ti. <laughs> I started. I started listening to Ti. Um, I'm serious. 2000, 2001, around about that time. Yeah, 2001. My cousin was, my cousin had just got to take a a, a, a a burnt CD from Atlanta. Guy on it. Then nobody knew who he was at the time. Mm-hmm. But he was snapping. Boy. Um, it was wild. Like that was, and T.I. was really the first Southern rapper that I was like, okay. I could, you know, T.I., he sounded like a Southern rapper, but the way he was putting them words together, that wasn't Southern like rap. Up North boy. Yeah, like yeah he was putting North them boy. together like an Up North boy, but he had the Southern swing on it. So it was, to me, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm vibing. But almost right. every song on I'm Serious was Dope Boys in the Trap. Either that right. or some funny shit by I Can't Be Your Man. Right. Pimping. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, track four on I'm Serious. I think that was the storage uh, show. These niggas robbing me. I yeah. swear to God, it's not Black like so. Robbery. But yeah. even that, like, talking about a, a dangerous situation, going to hell and blasting the devil with, with 40 foes and shit. Like, it was just so. <laughs> yeah. I can pinpoint that. Um, I live after listening to that album uh, at that young of an age, I was like, man. See, I'm yeah. trying to do it. I'm trying. I'm trying to see with the music. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to live that. I turned into a Look. white boy listening to listening to hip hop music, and these niggas are wild out here. <laughs> trying to see what that's like. Hey, and you in the projects, right? Right. Which that's is funny. the crazy part of it, right? I'm in the projects, listening to somebody talk about something that's allegedly happening in the projects. And I'm like, I'm trying to see what that's like. Look, and my I, young I know, mind, I wasn't able to compute exactly what was going right, on. Right, right. I know it was happening in the projects because I the times I'd have been in the projects, I'd seen plenty of stuff myself, so I know it's happening, right? Oh so, yeah, it was going down. Yeah, so I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna throw it to PC so he can fill us in on a little more of how it affected him. But for me, 1994. Well, before 1994, growing up in Tallahassee, Florida, growing up in Florida. That remember Luke ruled the South, ruled our, our part of hip hop for a long time. So that bass music, that booty music. So sex. All I know is I wanted sex at an early age because that's all the music was talking about. <laughs> popping coochie and all these things here. Cause it was for the music. Everybody, everybody dancing and stuff. So like here, here um in Florida, like with the the influence of the culture on the music, the hardest killers, the hardest gangsters are the best dancers. So you had a lot of the dancing music. And then mm-hmm. 1994 hit, and that's when I learned about, well, no, before, that's when Doggy, that's when I, I started listening to the Doggy Style album. But when I discovered Bone Thugs and Harmony, and and Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg around like 91, 92 blew my mind. And then like when the chronic came out and when Doggy Style came out, I know I would I I wanted to be a G from Compton. I really did. I wanted to be a G from Compton. I wanted to smoke weed, bitches wasn't shit. And I was I was literally calling everybody tricks. I was in the fourth grade and I was calling everybody <laughs> tricks. Right, because everybody around us was listening to it. So, like my so my brother listening to Outkast and UDK. I'm not on that yet because he not letting me listen to his music. But I'm listening yeah. to Snoop and Bone Thug. So, how brother like me smoking maintain remains the same. Bone Thugs talking about smoking weed. Snoop them talking about smoking weed and mixing in the element of pimping these with pimping these women. So getting into that and then when i started getting into southern hip-hop when i started getting into outcast ugk eight ball mm-hmm. mjg scarface you know it was the it was basically some of the same things but it related more to my environment then learn um learning about trick getting on trick daddy and jt money them like straight mm-hmm. up to that and jt money because they florida mm-hmm. and so 
I wanted, I wanted um uh, what six to the top, eight to the bottom, gold teeth. Mm-hmm. I wanted that. And at that time I had hair. So like ninth grade, I actually had them Florida wickets. I had mm-hmm. them Florida <laughs> wickets. I just didn't have the goals. Because I was <laughs> I was gonna be our version. So that's how it was influencing me. But also we're talking about environment. The first my first time seeing crack and seeing somebody actually be involved in some type of usage of crack i was eight years old i had a neighbor that was 11 years old he by the time he was 11 he had then tried crack he was smoking weed and he was having sex mm. by the time and this is these are the cats that me and my brother was hanging out with every day the environment outside we was on the south side putting them avenue gunshot we down the street from the projects that pat was living in crackheads gunshots our the house we was living in at that time was broken into 11 times. We just didn't have the money to move. We was in the hood. So like Pat was saying, we're in the hood. I'm affected by these things in the hood. And I'm listening to this music. I remember seeing crack affect my side of town on Tallahassee. Like the side I'm living on now, the west side, living on McCasco Avenue. I remember one year we can go across the street. The next year we can't go across the street. But then when I'm listening to the music and then they're talking about how much money they making off of crack, how many women they getting, like how fly they are, how cool they are. Of course, at that time, I'm a young elementary schooler, even middle schooler. Yes, I'm influenced by this. My when I was in high school, each each group of dudes had their own had their own name. I was with CPT because we was the whole crew was influenced by West Coast hip hop like that. We was influenced by the South, but we just it, we was fascinated by California because we ain't never been there. So we called ourselves CPT, chilling, pimping, and tapping that ass. Right? Because And we was known as the funny cats. But also, like Pat was saying, 2001 when T.I. came out, that I'm serious? Bruh. That hotel song? Because mm-hmm. I was already influenced from an early age. Sex, 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 sex. That's how, that's how the, the music influenced me. Made me want to have Make me think I was supposed to have sex with any girl that looked me in my eyes. So, you know, that whole that hurt that hotel son, my home, I remember it like it was yesterday. Me, Doc, Caleb, and Shane. We leaving football practice. Doc, like, hey man. Cause Doc is the one who always put us on all the new hip hop music. They like, hey man, check this out. Got this new cat named T.I. Heard that hotel son, they heard that dope boys in the trap. It was, it was over. Nah, it didn't. I had a, I had strong male influences in my life, who some didn't sell dope, some did sell dope, and they were not gonna let me do that. So the male influences in my life helped curb a lot of those negative influences that I had from hip hop, from the music, and from the environment when I was young, as I got older. But I can say I was. That's how I was affected by the music. It really made me want to have <laughs> sex with any good-looking woman that looked me in my eyes. So that's it's- that's me. I, Go ahead. See, now, now real quick, that because what you said right there was interesting just because we grew up in the same area. Right, right. But listen to different music. I remember Hotel. Hotel was the first song I really paid attention to where they was, where somebody was rapping about getting ass, and I thought it was lit. Yeah. Um, well, we didn't say lit back then, but you get what I'm saying. Um, you said live. <laughs> yeah, it was live. That shit fire, because fire ain't new. Five, five. You tell yeah. these young people, five ain't new. Anyway, um, girls was never really on my radar because the music I was listening to was always about drugs or money or, 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 or getting into a physical altercation with a guy. So my early formative years, elementary school, middle school, I ain't calmed down until ninth grade at Rickards. Mm-hmm. I was fighting. All the goddamn time. Um, girls, I never like it. Girls was just, and that's something I'm just thinking about I'm now. About because of what you what just said, I never really listened to music where they made women a big deal. Women was all, and then I like my mom was always like, you know, don't don't really be worried about girls. You got plenty of time for that. But the music always emphasized money over hoes, and you know. The women were always hoes. It wasn't no such thing as a girl that was worth your time. Right. So right, I but, just think that's interesting because a lot of my friends that I hung out with, 
with certified hoses, even in middle school. They was all I, I was the only person that wasn't fucking like crazy and wasn't stressed about pussy at all. But right. we listen, all of us. Well, I listened to totally different music, right? Than they did, and I, you know, that's just something interesting to consider. Because, because the idea for me was, if you don't have a roster of chicks, then you ain't a man. Because, because I listened, because especially when I got to southern hip hop, it was had more of the pimping flair as well. So, there you go. So, PC, how did how did it personally affect you? Well, wow, we got to go way back. Right, <laughs> and see that's what's gonna be interesting about this question. Yeah, you mentioned something about um, what are you talking about? You were talking about like uh, the gold teeth and this, that, and the other. Nineteen ninety four, which was interesting because I was in college. I was in uh, I was uh, maybe a sophomore, or yeah, I was about a sophomore between sophomore and junior year in college. So in college, we were extracted from philly so we didn't get the philly vibe up there we got whatever was on mtv whatever was on bet was bet out back then but um mm-hmm. whatever was on mtv and bet we were all wearing um flannels like the 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 um flannels that they were wearing out there in uh in in uh la we were all like dressing like that that was the cultural influence but it was and then when you start talking about the word trick, we had some brothers from Harrisburg that that was the only word they used. You know, everybody was a bitch ass trick. <laughs> <laughs> so when you said that, that's why I started laughing because it took me back to that because um, at that particular time, East Coast music was like dwindling. It wasn't until later in 94 where Biggie Smalls sort of like resurrected the East Coast music, um, John. Um, because the me- East Coast music was more about, you know, uh, metaphors and being able to put slick lines together. It wasn't until Biggie came out with the hardcore, you know, if you don't know, now you know. It wasn't until that that the style on the East Coast actually changed again and sort of like became relevant in that particular time. So that was interesting. But, you know, um, like if I want to go back to like the influence of hip hop on me in that particular time, yo, we was all break dancing, um, battle dancing. We all had the the cardboard on the sidewalk trying to do windmills and stuff. Um, you know the popping, and you know, I mean, I can still do a little bit of it now. You know, you know what I mean. <laughs> we, we, but it was more so. Uh, we learned a lot of new dances, a lot. So a lot of it was a social. But here's the rip. On this side, at like the dollar parties, rent parties, and things of that nature, the basement parties, we didn't really dance. You know, when the music came on, if you was dancing, people were looking at you like you're sweet. Like, okay, we're going to rob him after this. So we didn't dance in those yeah, parties. Yeah. We, was, we, we would lean on the wall. We had this thing called the area. I'm from area F, so we had this thing called the area F strut, where you just stand still and do a two-step. But that was you. That was all you really were allowed to do. You went in trying to flip around and do all kinds of craziness, man. People look at you sideways. But uh, we, um, but when you think I was, shoot, as a teenager, 13, 14 years old, we had our own rap crew. Um, I had two turntables and a microphone. I was sitting there trying to learn the Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. That's when Will Smith was the Fresh Prince, y'all. They, they were from Philly. And Jazzy Jeff was a highly renowned DJ. He had this one particular cut called the Transformer Cut. And I had to find the song, and I actually learned how to do the Transformer Cut on turntable. Um, but so so hip-hop had a tremendous influence on us in terms of culture. Because you got to think about it. When you're a, po- a people that's in poverty, and you real poverty, you know what I'm saying? Uh, heat off for the winter. You're using um, hot plates to heat up water to, to you know, um, to, to so that you can wash up and get ready for school. Uh, you had to take a bath, but to take a bath, you had to fill up, like, you had to run, like, <laughs> two hot plates with the big-ass uh, bacon pans, um, the, those turkey bacon pans that people use, those roaster pans, to, to fill up the bathtub, to take a tub, you know. 
when you live like that um for a little bit of time you had you try to escape the the reality that you're in and hip-hop gave us that escape rapping we would be at the lunch tables beating on the tables uh you know either mimicking our favorite rappers or or putting together our own song you know so it was an escape it wasn't until uh we started getting to high school and we started hearing the announcements over the the psa that uh you know one in two thousand of y'all are going to get killed today and they would literally say that at my high school i went to simon Gratz high school they would literally say that over there you know we would hear that um not every day you would hear it but you would hear it enough to say that, you know that um and at the height of the crack cocaine era, we knew that people, that's when we started seeing bodies drop in our age group. And we're talking like 1990 to about 1992. That's when we started seeing that, that real impact of, of that. But then that was sort of immersed into hip hop culture that wasn't hip hop culture. So that's why I'm saying the culture itself didn't destroy the black community. The black community has never been stable. We've always had to fight those situations and that the resilience, hip hop was the resilience of that. Hip hop was us broadcasting our stories because we right. didn't get to tell our story. So when you started hearing um, like the Boogie Down Productions and they started telling the stories, the Poor Righteous Teachers, they started telling the x Clan, they started telling our stories. When you started hearing, like I said, I go back to, I think one of the most conscious rappers, one of the most conscious albums of all time is America's Most One. It's one of the most conscious rap albums I've ever heard. Because Q it. wasn't, he wasn't breaking down, like he wasn't glorifying or glamorizing that lifestyle. He talked about going to his chick's house and then finding out that it was a crack house and he's trying to leave. You know what I'm saying? And he got caught up in the mix. You know, he's talking about... uh policies and and, and 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 politics on that particular album you know uh a lot of people don't really understand that when we heard like i said before that uh, hearing about to learn about uh my first trip to to the west coast was las vegas in 2000 in the year 2000 <clears throat> to learn about that i took the rap music that was going on out there and then i read two books monster cody scott book which is an excellent read i suggest everybody read Rest in peace, Master Cody Scott. He just died a few years ago. Um, and there was another book talking about the destruction of uh, of, of uh, Death Row, something like the downfall of Death Row. And I read those two books on the airplane going to California. I mean, going to Nevada, to um, to Las Vegas. Those that's how we learned about the different cultures, and that actually helped me navigate because there was some gang shit going on in Vegas when I was out there. Um, I literally stayed in the same hotel that Tupac was in the night he got killed, the Luxor Hotel. So there was some gang shit going on out in Las Vegas that I was, I was, I was able to peep because that's that wasn't the culture here at the time. But I was able to peep it because of what the music showed me. It was kind of like a roadmap, like a do's and don't, and what to look out for. I was able to see all that, and we were pretty much able to have a good time because we were able to navigate safely through those those different things right. that was going on out there. So, rest in peace to my god brother Abe. He had us, me and my oldest brother, he had us listening to Q, America's Most Wanted. We was listening to that ride around Tallahassee with my god brother Abe. So, that's one of the reasons why I went back and brought that album because he, he introduced us to Ice Cube. But also, shout out to Keith Turner. I forgot about this. When we were in elementary school, me and my brother, we were in elementary school. We used to go to Walker Fort Community Center for our after school program. And if you're from Tallahassee, you know anything about Walker Ford, you in the Bond, Houghton Street community. And if you don't know how to fight, do not come to this center at that time. <laughs> and somebody was getting jumped every day. So, and to keep us out of trouble, uh, Keith created a drill team. It was about 12 of us. He, he created a, a military drill team out of us. And we used to step to public enemy all the time, fight the power. So that's it's one of the reasons why I fight the power is like my favorite all-time favorite hip hop song. But we were he he put us on to public enemy before I was introduced to I, before I was really immersed into the gangster rap. But he put us on public enemy. So I think that's one of the things that helped me is having some of the balance and understanding that consciousness gets injected into hip hop from time to time. 
and being able to be exposed to that but also having actual real men in my life my daddy and everybody else who i knew that i couldn't do a lot of these things these rappers was talking about because i was gonna get my head cracked now two more two more quick questions on the table so then we're gonna wrap this up so right, before you before you do that i just want to say ahead. shout out to my big my, my big homie my og uh professor griff man solid brother man yes, and I, I met Professor Griff uh once we came up. He did a look here at Pan News Terry Page, and I was able to meet Professor Griff. So shout out. So why does hip hop negatively affect poor black communities in a way that it doesn't affect other aspects of a more affluent black community or even other races or cultures or communities? Why is that, Pat? I think it's about identification. Um <clears throat> one one i think one part of it is people that are in poverty that are lacking resources are looking for a way to get resources and rap in particular positions itself as a blueprint to get in paper a lot of the songs a lot of the uh you know outlines for getting paper but i think on the other side they they talk about rap nowadays especially is billed as something that has a connection to the poverty impoverished communities the people that are in those communities see themselves in the rappers because the rappers do their best to position themselves as something that is like the people in those communities um even though we know nowadays it's really it seems like it's too it's really only two types of rappers out nowadays one the murderers that the actual killers and then two the suburban kids pretending it don't seem like it's a lot of middle ground either use a stone cold killer or use a, a hardcore faker um so but i do think positioning is one um identification is one i think with the more you grow up into the uh, upper scale of life in terms of the access to resources and opportunities one the less you identify with hip-hop really like on a core level but i think two the less you have a level of desperation that will cause you to look at hip-hop as anything other than entertainment you know what i'm saying like right. if, if if all your needs are met and you got a path moving forward and you know that this ain't your life you can look at him and this is an argument i have with people middle class black folk all the time because as somebody that come from poverty now i'm living in the middle slash upper class of life and they have been there their whole life they've been here they hope they don't understand so they're always like well how could you not see it as xyz and it's like well you're saying that from a position of somebody who's always had access to resources so you can see it as entertainment because for you it is just entertainment for me growing up with absolutely nothing this was a window into a world of extreme excess yes. i'm coming from a world of extreme lack i want to get to where they at so it don't seem to me it's a blueprint it becomes a road map if i follow this road man and that's that's also why you throw a rock in the hood you hit a rapper mm -hmm. if right. i follow this road back it's like pc said we used to do the same thing we we used to freestyle battle all day and all night literally all day and all night. everybody in my circle had a dream of being a rapper Me we too. was gonna get out the hood by rapping because yep. they did it Yep. those of us that knew that we weren't necessarily going to be pro athletes the only other option was rap yep so i think um that, that those are the biggest things is the the positioning of the artists and that's not just the artists because we know the record labels the record execs the industry the the machine behind the music positions these people in these places to appeal to a certain demographic for certain reasons and one of the reasons that they appeal to young black kids young impoverished communities 
is that they like they they position themselves as something that's like those people and even in doing that they now gain credibility for the bullshit that they rapping about you know if people that are living in that environment view you as a credible source people that don't live in that environment also view you as a credible source so you get into this interesting dynamic um and i think a perfect example of the way that whole machine works is when you look at uh uh the rainbow dude takashi 69. you know what i'm saying he got stamped by the hood which made him certified even though people that knew better knew that he wasn't yep Mm -hmm. and that stamp remained until he took it off hey so so I think that's a short form answer because I know they're going long. PC, why does, in your opinion, why does rap music, especially nowadays in 2023, why does it negatively affect the black community, poor black communities, different than other communities? I used to let my tape rock till my tape pop. Sipping on bamboo, <laughs> drinking on Sam, what is it, smoking on bamboo, sipping on private stock. Yeah. Way back. <laughs> um hanging pictures on the wall every saturday rap attack mr magic molly mall so that was like we idolized that lifestyle because we saw people who lived in the same places like past said come up i used to listen man and i don't tell this story for i used to freestyle with the roots like in cyphers rap cyphers they used to come to the school my they used to come i'm gonna put up it's come to bloomsburg university just in case anybody want to check this out my man, one of my brothers, a good brother of mine, Armin, he, they was his homies. They would come up every other weekend, and we would get into a circle in cypher. Now, I'm not saying I was like them, but I was the guy that typically started <laughs> off because I was with, I was the warm-up. So while they were thinking about, you know, they set it off. I, while they were thinking about what they were going to say, I'm out there flipping and flopping, dipping and dopping and saying whatever. And um, this is when we would drink out of trash cans. <laughs> So, um, but you know, uh, but we would see them and then you look at them blow up and like, damn, I could be me. Um, and you know, I'm not, but they, you know, these brothers was, was talented, of course. Um, but here's, here it is, right? Rap, our hip hop is the only culture that has to keep it real. It's the only form of entertainment. They have to keep it real. Everybody else is acting. You had uh, genres of music that have real impact. There was a time when they would stop children from listening to Pink Floyd records because how depressed they became and how many of them would start self-deleting from listening to a Pink Floyd a Pink Floyd album. There was an actual study done by that. Um, so the music in itself, yes, it's, it definitely has an effect on it. Here's the thing, though: everybody else has a counterculture, but us. So this is where we go hardcore. You can have even, you know, uh, heavy metal, uh, Lucifer worshiping, white performers kicking it. But then you go and look at the Congress and all these are white men sitting there in powerful position in government. You got, uh, you talk about the bourgeois Negroes. Well, they have the black caucuses. They have their circles. They're insulated from this people who live in poverty aren't insulated from anything because they are the designated bottom feeders of society and black people of all in america and globally are seen as the bottom feeders of society we are the ones the most colonized people in the history of this planet so even if we had a way to to uh denigrate this particular culture it would come back in a different form because it's designed to, to it's designed to be psych- cyclical in regards to keeping us in this mindset. And I said it before, for a lot of people who think that um, they don't understand, Patrick, you brought up a great example about how the bourgeois class of black America is always like, why can't they just get it together? You know, uh, well, for, for one, y'all Negroes created glass ceilings so that we have to, so because you wanted to be the top 10 percenters of the black community. That's one. Two, um, in regards to that, is when the people are demoralized, they don't see a way out. 
Demoralization is like being depressed as a society. It's like the person that can't get out of bed, but they know they have to go to the bathroom. They know they have to eat. They know they have to drink to survive. But they're so demoralized by life and the circumstances that keep them that way. It's not making excuses to talk about things that are factually accurate. And we don't, we have to get off of this thing where we have, we celebrate foolish pride because foolish pride is just an ego taking place where self esteem should be. But because we're people who are, have um, been identified, not just identified, but people who operate in low self esteem, demoralization, and things of that nature, it's very hard to get somebody to get out of their funk to think that they can actually build something because we only have one chance to build it. Every time we build things, we don't have safety nets to pick us back up. We can't make mistakes, especially as black men. We can't make any mistakes. Our leadership is questioned everywhere you go. We can't mm -hmm. make any mistakes. We only have one chance to get it right. White folk fail over and over and over and over again. The greatest white folk on the planet today have failed multiple times, hundreds of times. Some of the greatest inventions of all time said, I didn't fail a hundred times. I just figured out a hundred ways not to do it. We don't have that. We don't even get that grace in our own community. So when you talk about why we are still stuck here, it's because it's easier to swing for the curb than it is to shoot for the stars. Now, I'll hey. leave it. I'll land my hey. Hip hop music has become synonymous with black culture. The negativity in, in our communities, the negativity in the music has become synonymous with black culture. If you don't do this, you're not black. Hey, I tried to be a rapper. I tried to be a, I took the athlete route. Football didn't work out. Tried to play football at FAMU. Look, we got messed up by the paperwork. The paperwork. <laughs> so... We was already freestyling in high school because my, my, my group of friends, we was known for having fun, being funny, and freestyling all the time. So we was already freestyling. Matter of fact, we used to get kicked out of class just to go freestyle. Kids don't do that. So Ashanti Floyd, the mad violinist, mad violinist, shout out to Ashanti, he doing his thing all around the world. He got it. <laughs> we say we say he uh, got his early practice on us because we used to go out to his house and make songs. As a matter of fact, we made a we I think we made two albums. I, so we was bold enough. Our first album was a double disc. It's not good. It's not good at all. <laughs> I, dude, I would never let I, you would never hear that. I do not want people to hear what I was saying. You would never hear that. But after that, me and my homie Caleb and the homie Doc, we decided to try to become rappers for real. So we created classic status records. And we had a booth in our house and we was creating all types of music and stuff. We just didn't, we didn't understand the business of it coming out of Tallahassee. And then T-Pain popped. Now everybody want to be a rapper because you're right. We feel like music and sports is are things that get us out of our poverty. These are things that we, we should do because it's black culture. This is what black people do. We make music. We we do we make rap music. We make gangster rap music. But I also think that it negatively affects our community because some of the things you guys said, there are no buffers in our community. The same people who destroy the communities are the rappers these days. Because there was one time where you had Ice Cube who was telling the telling the stories about what happened around him. And nowadays, those people are telling their own stories. Nowadays, I think from the beginning, though, hip hop was created in a vulnerable, declining community. And we've always, we, we've continued to decline over the decades. Now, so now, now, so now in 2020, 2020, in 2023, we have this genre of music who has all these sub genres of music who are even more degenerate than the actual genre of hip hop itself. Southern, Southern, uh, I mean, rap country tunes. That's what we call Southern hip hop, rap country tunes. It's not always been the most positive music. Like I like, I like to listen to UGK. If you know anything about Bun B and Pimp C, 
you know, they don't make the most positive music. Uh, is that balancing? Yes. But that's the thing. The balance nowadays doesn't exist. Who controls the music? We don't. We gave up, like, black people created the hip-hop music and gave up control of it in the early days, but people don't want to talk about that. But I believe the the music negatively affects us because we believe that we are the negative things that's in the music and we believe we are the negative things that's in the culture. We want to be that. Think about it. When Glorilla song came out, when FNF came out, we all three of us, because we had multiple phone conversations where we was looking in the comments and we seen women saying, hey, I know I'm a 45-year-old married woman with three kids, but this song is my spirit animal. Oh, Glorilla is my spirit animal. They all champion, hey, I want, because you have professional people who want to be ratchet. Like you say, you got the you got the black people who didn't grow up in poverty. Like, if I hear this again, if I hear another, another child say, I want to be hood. Like, I've had parents tell me they had battles with their children because the child wants to grow up hood but the parent actually has a lifestyle that's not hood, but the music and the culture, because what it's synonymous with black culture. Now everything negative about the music, everything negative about our culture is what authentic black culture is. Now that's how we're seen today. So last question on the tape. And should we get rid of hip hop music? PC can go to you first. Should we get rid of hip hop music? No. No, nah, no, nah. I think one of the things we need to do is listen to what's being said. Um, a lot of times, these young folk are just, they're, they're, right now, the message of the community, just like it was broadcast to us um, over the last 40 years, we have to understand what the message is. And the message is to create resources so these young people don't have to rely on the streets to survive. They don't have to, to, you know, see themselves as ops. We need to come back to those places. There was a time on my block where you had people who owned businesses and you get to see them get up and walk out in the street on a day to day basis. Um, you don't have I'm as I'm one of maybe three professionals on my block today. But they had business people who had businesses um, who were shining examples of what we could accomplish. Who we could be they were they were the influences at that time and we need to get back to coming to those neighborhoods a lot of people talk real crazy because they're scared to come back here i can't, i left and came back and i'm not going nowhere until we fix what's wrong now you know and that's a dangerous thing but we always talk about being in a war i've never seen a war that was safe so if you are about that work and you just don't want to be you know a, a scholar you know, because I don't know what a warrior scholar is these days, but I do know what warriors do. And you come back home and you answer the call to what's going on in those neighborhoods. And that don't mean you have to move down here, but you have to create a presence down here because everybody else feels very comfortable coming to the places you called home at one point in time and setting up shop. It is. Pat, should we get rid of hip hop music? No, because I grew up what PC said earlier. It's cyclical. One, I don't think we realistically can. Not even, I don't even think we can like imaginarily do it. <laughs> but if we did, the the same type of people that are driving hip hop right now would find a new tool to drive, and, and the music would come back around because the core problem in hip hop. It's centered in the community and the culture. And that right. problem hasn't been fixed. If we fix that problem, there's no need to get rid of hip hop. Hip hop, hip hop will be what it was. Party music for kids. And for the adults that want to create something else, it'll they'll create some, uh, either another genre of hip hop or another style of music altogether. Because I don't believe that something can transform too far away from what it was intended to originally created to be hip-hop was originally created to be party music for kids and i do think a lot of us that are in our you know late 30s 40s on up we forget that a lot we you know we 
we tend to we like I hear a lot of us talking about how hip hop is a tool for education. And no, it's not. It's a tool for ass shaking. Stop getting mad when people shake their ass to it. That's what it's for. <laughs> um, so that that you know, that's my view. Um, and yeah. and I'll say this. There ain't nothing wrong with ass shaking music. I don't think there's anything wrong with um, you know, uh back that ass up and shit like that. It's fine. I just think that needs to be a balance, like you said, Joe. Uh if we're gonna be batting that backing that ass up, we also need to be like, you know, uplifting the the spiritual whatever. I don't know. Yeah. So you feel me? That's all I'm saying. Well, yeah. So you stole part of my answer because I was gonna say, uh Fix the culture, fix the people, you'll fix the music. Now, yeah. I will say this though. The back that ass up, I don't think it's good right now because the culture's so messed up. If the culture was better, if it was more balanced, so I get where you're going. I don't disagree. I just think if the culture was better, it would be less of a of an issue, or the twerking and stuff would be less of an issue if the culture was a bit better. But the culture is not as no, it's less balanced. But fix the people fix the culture the music will follow because the people who make the music they are expressing themselves and and everybody's first album is usually their whole life so if i grew up if if there's a reason that you know big crit's first album is different from nas's first album growing up in meridian mississippi versus the 40 side of queens it's it's, it's great differences but Poverty still both grew up in poverty, but different environments, different climates, different things. So you're gonna you're gonna get these things. I don't I don't think the music needs to be needs to go. But a lot of the negative elements that come from the people and come from the culture need to go. You change that, the music will change. So that means it's still on us to be the greatest versions of ourselves. But becoming the greatest version of yourself means more than um earning more money earning more status and being uh more celebrated on your job it's the personal development because once again you can't be in your 30s and 40s and successful in your professional life but want to be hood and ratchet in your personal life it don't go together how you do anything is how you do everything so let's stop lying to ourselves in the closing remarks, and I got I, I want to clarify. I'm glad you did, but I want to clarify again. Uh I don't have no problem with back that ass up from the standpoint of if you're in a, a relationship with somebody and y'all decide to get freaky slash funny, there should be music available for that. Mm-hmm. If your wife wanna be silly in front of you her husband and she turned on back that ass up and starts twerking in a circle there should be music for that now but now if yo if yo girl decides she want to be silly and funny and start twerking in the circle to back that ass up in front of the streets i get <laughs> well, that's a problem and you probably should leave her there because she's exactly where she belongs <laughs> so I just wanted to, you know, clarify. Yeah. Yeah. He said what he said. <laughs> hey, Joseph Ward, Professor Carl Tone Jones, Patrick Irvin. This is Breakdown Friday. Remember, FetLifeStation.com, 7 p.m. FetLifeStation.com, 7 p.m. Tune in. Professor Carl Tone Jones as he's dropping knowledge, trying to wake these young men up and get these relationships better. You all know how we do. We appreciate the love, appreciate the support. Um, Jacob, I appreciate the, the support. Everybody who sent me uh, PayPal's and sent money and donated to me, I appreciate you all. Philly Phil, you already know what it is. Keep the comments going. Everybody in the comments who continuously, Christine, I appreciate you. Everybody in the comments. And some, okay, some of you in the comments. <laughs> Don't hit send. Some of you <laughs> don't hit send. But I appreciate all the comments. But some of y'all just don't hit send, you know. But hey man, let's continue to love ourselves. Let's continue to get better. Breakdown Friday. Catch the next video. I love you all.